All right, so I did want to take a moment here and give you some supplemental information that might help you with um, some of the problems that we're doing. We have them all set up from linear algebra. Now it's just a matter of fitting the pieces together. So that's what we'll take a look at right now. So let me fade out here. What I want to talk to you about are linear systems of ordinary differential equations with real distinct eigenvalues. So the key point, and we're going to talk about this on Monday, but a lot of Monday we're going to spend concentrated on complex roots. For now, we want to deal with real distinct eigenvalues, and our differential equation is this. I have a vector x, and it has two components, and the derivative of that vector x is equal to some matrix A times the x vector. And so we talked about this um, on Wednesday's lecture, and so let's go over it here. The key point is that if I assume x looks like v e to the lambda t, then it turns out that we find that v and lambda satisfy the equation a v equal lambda v. But we know that is an eigenvalue eigenvector equation. That's the equation that we've studied. So it turns out that if lambda 1 and lambda 2 are different, then we get two linearly independent solutions. And those solutions can be used to represent the general solution. And that is x, the general solution, is equal to c1 times x1 plus c2 times x2. Well, what is x1? x1 is v e to the lambda t, where I have one v in one lambda, here's my v1, here's my lambda 1, plus x2, which is c2, v2, e to the lambda 2, t. So, how do we use this? Well, let's just take a look at the matrices that we had found the eigenvalues and eigenvectors for. So, the implication here is that lambda 1 is equal to 2 and lambda 2 is equal to 4 and that v1 the first eigenvector for this first eigenvalue is the vector 1 negative 1 and v2 is the second eigenvector associated with the second eigenvalue and that is just 1 1. So that is what we know from this coefficient matrix so if I looked at just this coefficient matrix Right? That's what I would find, and we found that, um, so I'll say C413 and 415 for details. So, how does that get involved in our differential equation? Well, here's my differential equation. I'm told to solve x prime equals matrix A times vector x, and here's my matrix A. Well, if I assume x looks like v e to the lambda t, then it turns out to just be an eigenvalue eigenvector problem, and I did that problem. We've already done that. So how does this fit together into my general solution? Well, my general solution, x of t, is going to be equal to c x1 vector of t plus c2 x2 vector of t but that's just c1 my x vector is going to be my eigenvector first eigenvector e to the first eigenvalue t plus c2 second eigenvector e to the second eigenvalue t so in my specific problem this is c1 1 negative 1 e to the 2t plus c2, 1, 1, e to the 4t. And that's my general solution. So finding the general solution is just a matter of mashing together the eigenvalue and eigenvector data according to this given form. All right, so let's take one more back look at this. If this is my first eigenvalue, well, then that just goes right there. If this is my second I first eigenvector, it goes right there. And this is my first solution. If that's the case, then here's my second eigenvalue. Here's my second eigenvalue in the form of the solution. Here's my second eigenvector. Here's my second eigenvector. And this forms the second eigen 
solution, it's often called. Well, we did another problem here with A being equal to 0, 1, 1, 0. Suppose that A matrix is the coefficient to this differential equation, which is the differential equation we're going to be studying for a while here. Well, that's lambda 1 is equal to 1. And lambda 1 had an eigenvector, and that was the vector 1, 1. And lambda 2 was equal to negative 1, and lambda 2 had an eigenvector, which was equal to 1, negative 1. And again, I have everything I need to form the solution. x of t, which is equal to c1, 1, 1, e to the t, plus c2, 1, negative 1, e to the negative t. And what is this? This is the general solution, but it is also a linear combination of linearly independent solutions. What does this part mean? Well, we're talking about these linearly independent solutions. How do I know that two solutions are linearly independent? Well, we have this Ronsky indeterminant. What is the Ronsky indeterminant? It would be the determinant of the first solution, which is e to the t in the first component, e to the t in the second component, and then the second solution, which is e to the negative t, and negative e to the negative t in the second component. And if I found out or calculated this determinant, I'd get e to the t times e to the negative t, which is just 1. So I'd get times a negative, give me a negative 1. And then I got a negative 1, so that's equal to negative 2, and that's definitely not 0. So these moves feel just like they did when we had second order problems. What I want to point out here is that all the linear independence is really telling us is that this vector right here, this first eigenvector, is independent or points in the plane in a different direction than this second eigenvector. And it turns out just like we had for second order problems that if you do the math correctly then um, these will naturally be linearly independent and so you just form linear combinations to get the solution. And the last thing I'd like to show then is how to do work with initial conditions. So this came from a slide problem and so A implies the following eigenvalues. Here's lambda 1 is equal to negative 1. And my first eigenvector we found in class from this is 2, negative 3. And then we could also go and search for the second eigenvalue, which is lambda 2 is equal to um, 6. And then the second eigenvector is equal to 1, 2. And so as a way to help out, let me transfer... Oh. to this thing called symbol lab. And so in this web interface, I can specify two by two matrix and I can say find the eigen vectors of that two by two matrix and just tell it to go. And it will tell me the relevant information. Here's the negative two, three vector. And uh, we must have found that out from last time. And then this other one is a 1, 2 vector, which we've just copied down, right? So we can use that to check our work and guide our work while we do these problems. But it doesn't matter. That leads to a general solution is x of t is equal to c1, 2, negative 3, e to the negative t, plus c2, which is multiplied then by 1, 2, and then times e to the 6, or e to the 6t, excuse me. So that's my general solution. I cook it up just like I did before. But now, if I wanted to calculate c1 and c2 associated with these initial conditions, everywhere I would see a t, I'd put a 0, so I get an e to the 0, plus c2, 1, 2, e to the 0. So that gives me... 2c1 plus c2, and then negative 3c1 plus c2, or plus 2c2, 
And what should that equal? That should equal whatever this x of 0 vector is, and that's the vector 1, 1. So what I have is 2c1 plus c2 is equal to 1, or in other words, that tells me that um, c2 is equal to 1 minus 2c1. And then knowing c2, inside the second equation, now I have negative 3c1 plus 2c2, but that's negative 3c1 plus 2 times 1 minus 2c1. So that gives me negative 3c1 plus 2 minus 4c1 or negative 7c1 plus 2 is equal to 1. So evidently, c1 is equal to um, 1 seventh. If c1 is equal to 1 seventh, then that means that this is 1 minus 2 sevenths is c2. So that's 7 sevenths minus 2 sevenths is equal to 5 sevenths. That's my c2. So what is my x of t? My x of t is c1, which is 1 seventh times 2 negative 3 e to the negative t plus my c2, which is 5 sevenths, 1, 2, e to the 6t. And that's it. That's how I use the initial conditions to find the solution to the initial value problem. And so if I wanted to write this as one vector, I would have 2 sevenths e to the negative t plus 5 sevenths e to the 6t, and then negative 3 sevenths e to the negative t plus 10 sevenths e to the 6t. So that's a little guidance on how we use the eigenvalues and eigenvectors to solve these differential equations. And then the key point here is that once those things are found, the general solution can just be written down, which is why we um, spent so long working on getting that eigenvalue problem up and running. So now that we have that, we'll go over that a bit on Monday and um, talk about what happens with complex roots, and that should be enough to complete our work. But this will give you um, a leg up on, on getting the real ones done. So have a good week.